Well, hello and greetings to Bishop Oriol, to Pastor Geraldine, and to everyone in the national G12 team in Philippines, and to all the pastoral body that are connected to this magnificent conference. Well, because it is a time for pastors only today, we could speak from heart to heart. There is a scripture that is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and verse 11. And I think you all know it by heart. Nevertheless, it's well worth it to mention it. It says, And they have overcome by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Today, I want to share a message called More Than Conquerors. Now, my daughter, Manuela, she was reading a book by a very well-known pastor from the United States, Charles Swindle, and she said that she was amazed by the book. What an amazing book. But she said, nevertheless, the last chapter where he talked about divorce really shocked her because he told the story of when his wife asked him for a divorce. And she said, all the beautiful things he wrote in all the chapters was like destroyed by the last chapter. And then she asked me, why is it that big ministries, strong ministries, why do they go through such things? And we know that it's because of a reason, because they do not keep their priorities in order. The Lord compares the ministry to the relationship that Jesus had with the church. As ministers, we need to live our lives focused on our relation, relationship. We need to consolidate our families. We need to protect our children. Because a lot of times, pastors lose their focus. They lose the sight of what is important because they think that the most important thing is to be productive in the ministry, but that is a terrible mistake. Success in the ministry depends on little details, and many pastors do the opposite. And it could end up happening like what happened to a man that was hired to cut down trees. It turns out that the first day he cut down 18 trees. The second day he went down to 14. The third day he went down to 8 trees. And on the last day he only cut down one tree. So he went to his boss and he said, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I'm trying hard. I'm waking up early. I'm working very hard. But but yet, I don't know why my numbers are dropping. And he asked him a question. When was the last time that you sharpened your axe? You see, it's little details that if we don't take them into consideration, it's going to be reflected in everything else. And I believe that the blessing of any pastor is in the way in which they sharpen their acts, not only in studying the Word of God, but also in having a great relationship with their family, in having a great relationship with themselves, in having a very good relationship with their disciples. Those are just some fundamental aspects that will help us to truly be able to focus. My daughter said to me, Daddy, thank you, because you have given a place to mom in ministry. And because of that, we, your daughters, have been involved in the ministry as well. And you know, none of my daughters are involved in the ministry because we ever tried to impose ministry on them. No, they felt encouraged by the good example of our relationship. Sometimes when you look at big ministries, you end up shocked by the struggles that the ministers experience. My other daughter, which is my eldest daughter, Johanna, she attended an event by Joyce Mayer, and it was an amazing event. But one of the speakers was the daughter of Reverend Billy Graham, and she basically shared her testimony. And it turns out that there was a season that she had backslidden from God. She was a single mother. Later, she was restored. She got married, but then her daughter ended up falling into the same problem. She became a single mother, and she kind of lost her balance and there was a lack of balance in the family and basically she shared in that conference that her father Billy Graham basically traveled eight months of the year every year one day he came back home and he found a beautiful baby in the house and he picked up the baby and he said whose child is this 
And turns out that he didn't even realize that his wife was pregnant because he traveled so much that he focused so much on the ministry that there was a time where he was neglecting his relationship with his family. One day, he got home and saw a beautiful child. Whose child is this, honey? It's your son. He didn't even know that his wife had been expecting a child because of all the traveling, because he had been so focused on the ministry, and he was losing sight of the most important part of our ministry, which is the family. Now, of course, we all know that Billy Graham's ministry is one of the most outstanding, most respected, and most influential ministries Nevertheless, there was a season where the family really struggled. After nine years of pastoring very small churches, the Lord called me to the ministry. And how was it that He called me? Well, the latest church that I pastored before I started our church, I started it with 30 people. We ended up having 120 people. But to retain the fruit, it became the greatest struggle to me because it was as if there were a back door in the church where people were just leaving. And in the midst of my anguish, as I was seeing people that were just deserting the church, what really worried me is that there was a young man that had a great ability for leadership, and I found that he was not attending the church, so I decided to visit him at home, and I wanted to invite him, to encourage him, to tell him it's important for you to come back. We miss you. You have a great future. But the young man had a very arrogant attitude, and he said, one of these days I will visit you. Oh, that really broke my heart. And I said, Lord, is this what it, it is to be in ministry, to beg people so that they could be blessed by you? If this is the ministry, then I don't want to continue being a pastor. And I turned in my resignation letter to the church, and I said, Lord, I am not going to commit to any church or any ministry or any denomination unless you speak to me. And after I made that decision, several pastors that were friends of mine, a lot of them, they tried to recruit me to work for their ministries, but I said, no, thank you. I have a commitment with God. I'm waiting for God to speak to me. So about four months later, I was on a holiday. I was on vacation with my family. It was at a beach in Colombia, and one of the days of my holiday, I went to the beach by myself to talk to the Lord. I brought a rocking chair with me to the shore, and I was rocking the chair, and I was worshiping the Lord, and suddenly I had a supernatural experience. I felt that the presence of God came from behind me, and He began to speak to me, and He said, Son, I am the Ancient of Days. Prepare your heart in worship because I am going to speak to you. And I was rocking my chair and I began to worship the Lord with all my heart, with all my strength, and I was giving my whole heart to worshiping God and suddenly I felt the presence of God again. And He said, I'm going to rock your chair. So I sat still waiting for him to rock my chair. I waited for a good while, but nothing happened. So I went back to rocking the chair myself, and then I heard the voice of God saying to me, Son, I can rock your chair directly, but I prefer to do it through you. I can speak to people directly, but I prefer to do it through you. And he said to me, just dream with a very large church, because dreams are the language of my spirit. He said, the church that you will pastor will be so numerous. It will be like the stars in the heavens, like the sand in the sea. It will be a countless multitude. And then the Lord asked me, what kind of church would you like to pastor? And my mind went back to the latest church that I had pastored. And I realized that there were so many barriers in my mind that I needed to be free from the wrong kind of vision in my mind. And I thought, this is a bad mold for me. And I broke that paradigm in my mind. Suddenly, I found myself staring at the sand in the beach. And I, I was like asking a question. I thought, what is it? 
about sand that the Lord mentions it as an example. And so I was saying, what is it about the sand? What is it? And suddenly, it's like as if the the sand was entering because in a vision I could see every grain of sand transformed into a person and I found myself seeing in a vision hundreds of thousands of people and the Lord said what are you looking at I said Lord I see hundreds of thousands of people and the Lord said to me well that and much more will I give to you if you walk in my perfect will look it's interesting the Lord what he was saying to me it's basically the first thing that the Lord trained me in, He trained me in visions and dreams. And He used something quite simple. And it's the same thing that the Lord said to Abraham. I mean, basically, it was the same words that He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to me. Now, why does the Lord do that? If you carefully study the way in which the Lord spoke to Abraham, that was not something that Isaac took and said, I'm going to take the words that God gave to my father Abraham. No, the Lord spoke directly to Isaac in first person. Now, Jacob, Jacob didn't take what God spoke to Abraham and to Isaac. No, the Lord himself spoke to Jacob in first person. And that is what God wants to do. He wants to speak to us. Many people want to live the experience of a ministry under somebody else's shadow. And what do I mean by somebody else's shadow? They say, Pastor, Lord, you've given a word to that pastor, and I want that same word for me. But you see, God is a personal God. You could pray that God speak to you, but you can't take someone else's word. You need to wait for God to speak to your heart and that you understand that that is God's rhema word for your life that you could take hold of it and that you could walk in that same word. That is what I experienced. God spoke to me in first person. I didn't have to go and say, I claim the same blessings that you gave to Abraham or the same blessings that you gave to Isaac or the same blessings that you gave to Jacob. No, I didn't have to do that because God is a personal God. And to get into the world of visions and dreams, the Lord himself, he has to bring us to a place where he himself, he's going to take specific words. Yes, they could be very similar to what he's given to someone else, but he's going to speak words that will reach into our hearts. Now, you guys have a privilege because in Philippines, you have some of the most beautiful beaches. You guys are in, you have so many islands in the beautiful nation of Philippines. You guys could go to the beach and you could take a time. Yes, maybe you could rest. Maybe you could take a break from your work and go to the beach and stare at the sand and have a time of intimacy with God until God speaks to you directly in first person. When God spoke to me, everything within me changed because I knew what the Lord had placed in my heart. And then the Lord Himself, He spoke to me of a fundamental thing that I think every pastor needs to have as a priority. He gave me five priorities. He said they are fundamental for me to experience in my ministry. He said, look, I want you to know that the number one priority of your life must be God. And he said something else. He said many people believe in God, but very few live their lives in love with God. Notice the first priority, number one in your life must be God. And for God to be number one, He has to become the breath that we breathe. He has to be the most important person in our lives. It has to be God. Our lives depend on God. But we need to be in love with God. And to be in love with God means that we long for His presence continually in our lives. Just as it happens in our emotional life or, our, or in our marriage life, that is how our relationship with God needs to be. And why? 
do I take this as an example? Because God said to me, you need to treat your wife the way you would treat the Holy Spirit. So I understood that my wife, the wife plays a very important role. You never yell at the Holy Spirit. The Lord said, don't you ever yell at your wife. Don't you ever ignore your wife. Don't you ever despise your wife. And so to have a relationship with God is to work on having a good relationship with the Father. It's to have a very good relationship with the Son and to have a great relationship with the Holy Spirit. And in the mornings, which is my favorite time for prayer, I always invest time on the Father. I invest time on the Son. I invest time on the Holy Spirit. A lot of times the Lord, He just leads me to just have my relationship with the Father for an entire morning. And it brings me to a supernatural experience where I feel like I'm in another world. In other occasions, it's just worshiping the Son. And I experience the blood of Jesus. I am transformed just like when the Apostle John, he was transported in the Spirit to the third heaven where he saw the wonders of God. And it's just like what he shared in chapter 4 and 5 in the book of Revelation. A lot of times I feel like I get into the words that the Apostle said and I begin to feel that I'm in the very presence of God. I start to feel that I am in the presence of the Lamb just as it is described in chapter 5 I feel that I'm surrounded by seraphim and I feel that I am surrounded by angels that I am surrounded by the elders the Bible calls them kings and I sit there and I feel like I'm transported and I experience the glory the presence of God it is such a deep time of intimacy with God but in other occasions it is just intimacy with the Holy Spirit because when you have intimacy with God everything within you changes. You would never like to come out of that time of prayer because you just enjoy the glory, the presence of the Lord, that it is like the fuel that He gives us so that we could move forward, so that we could influence so many people. And so we keep our hearts connected to the Holy Spirit of God. And that is why the Lord said to me, your number one priority in your life has to be God. And then He said, your second priority priority is you. Your life is important because you are the channel through which my spirit flows. Now, what does it mean that our life is the second priority? We need to remember that we have three areas, spirit, soul, and body. And our spirit, we feed it through the Word of God. We feed it through worship, through prayer. But our soul, our mind, our emotions, and will it is something that we need to take care of. And how do we take care of our mind? Well, with what we read, with what we see, with what we think. All of that is to protect our mind. Many people, they basically do not know how to control their thoughts. It's quite the contrary. It's their thoughts that control them. But our thoughts, where do our thoughts come from? From what we watch on television, from what we read, from the conversations that we have, from the atmosphere of the place where we live. That is where our thoughts come from, and we need to be very careful with our mind and our thoughts, but we also need to be careful with our emotions. We need to be careful. And in that sense, there are people that come from a family background where they were hurt even before the time they were born. From the time they were in their mother's womb, they were wounded. And when they were born, they continue with those wounds. And even though they are part of a Christian circle, there is not a change within them. And that is when it is necessary for God Himself to begin to work on every one of us, reaching into the most intimate areas of our lives, bringing that which is concealed to the surface and bringing us to a new dimension. You know, speaking on that subject, I had an experience with the Lord. I was working on a sermon that I was going to preach to our leaders. And while I was working on that sermon, I had prepared ways in which we could relate to God in the area of intuition, 
communion and conscience because I was explain I wanted to explain to our leaders that our spirit is made of three areas intuition communion and conscience our soul has mind emotions and will and our body has the five senses and during a time of prayer the Lord said to me he said son I'm going to deliver you in your spirit and I came into that time of ministry and there was an experience of deliverance in my intuition. Now, for you to understand it, intuition is the most elevated part of our spirit. It is related to our communion with the Father. Intuition is what causes us to have a relationship with Father God. The opposite of intuition is the occult. In other words, our intuition is our life of holiness at the highest level. And then that communion relates us to the Holy Spirit. And then comes our conscience, which relates us to Jesus, who is God's Word. And as I was praying, the Lord began to minister to me that He would deliver my intuition. And then I found myself in a vision where I saw myself in a warehouse that was 12 by 12 meters long. And I could see that it had pillars on both sides. There were like six pillars on one side and six on the other side. And on each pillar, there was a demon holding a scroll with an argument written on it. And as I was in the process of praying, the Lord said, do you remember what happened when you were 16 years old? And in my mind, I clearly saw what happened when I was 16. It turns out that the husband of one of my sisters had an uncle who was a wizard. One day, he came to visit our family, and so we were all gathered together in our living room. I had 11 siblings, and we were all gathered together in our living room, and suddenly they came in with that man. And after the, he was introduced, everyone went to the second floor, and I ended up alone with that wizard. And he said to me, would you like for me to do a few magnetic passes on you? I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, okay, sure. So he came up to me, and and he said, look, whatever your concept is of God, just close your eyes and think of Him. So I thought, okay, I'll close my eyes and think of God. So that man began to lay his hands on my head, and he was doing magnetic passes. Now, I felt nothing. I felt nothing at all. There was not a feeling, nothing. However... The Lord revealed to me that night. He said, do you remember when that man laid his hands on you? And I said, yes. He said, well, that affected your intuition. And I said, but Lord, I was thinking of you. And he said, yes, but you were receiving through the wrong channel. When that man laid his hands on you, it was like putting a rooftop over you where it was interrupting your communion with the Lord. In that moment, I acknowledged my sin. I repented. I fell on my knees before the Lord and I said, Lord, forgive me for having accepted this. And today I renounce to the curse that came over my life because of his laying on of hands. And I felt that day that I was delivered. But the Lord himself, he gave me a vision. And I found myself back in that place where I could see the pillars in that warehouse. And there were demons. In that moment, I saw an angel that came in. And he was passing by every one of the pillars, taking every one of the arguments in the hands of the demons. And then he went to the exit door. But at the exit door, the cross was there and Jesus was hanging on the cross. And every one of those arguments were canceled on the cross. And I found myself at the exit door. And I saw that the door opened. And as I was going to step outside, I realized, realized that that place was like suspended in the heavens. And I thought, well, the law of gravity teaches that everything must come down. But I needed to come out of there. And when I came out of there, immediately I began to go up at an amazing speed. And the Lord said to me, 
You have been set free in your intuition, and now you come into a new dimension. And that is when my life in that area came to another dimension. And then later, when I went to the service where I was going to preach to my leaders, after I prepared that message, every time I would preach after my message, people would stand in long lines asking for 20 minutes of my time. Some people would say, Pastor, I need 30 minutes of your time, 40 minutes. And everyone was always asking me for a bunch of time. I thought I'm going to need eternity to be able to talk to everyone. But after that experience, everything changed because the the person that came and said, I need 20 minutes of your time, I said, look, it's not necessary. This is your problem, and this is what you need to do. And in a matter of seconds, I began to deal with problems that would take me half a day, but in a matter of minutes, I could deal with them. And then the next person, pastor, I said, look, don't tell me this is your problem, and this is what you need to do. But that happened when I was delivered in my spirit. And that that is why, dear pastors, it is important for you to be very honest with the Lord. If you were wounded in because of the occult or because of family members that practiced the occult, look, you need to get into the presence of God. He wants to break the chains in your life. He wants to bring you to a, another dimension. Now, if you had problems in your sexual area, the Lord wants to break those chains as well. The important thing is that you will open your heart, that you allow Jesus to be the one who helps you, that you could receive his blessing, that you could break those bondages. And the Lord, he's going to help you. Now, some people have a struggle in their conscience, but that is where the word of God comes in to break every bondage. Remember, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Third, what the Lord said to me, your third priority is your family. Your family needs to become a model. It needs to be an example. And look, basically, that needs to happen from the very beginning of our marriages. When I married my wife, Emma Claudia, I said, honey, we're going to make an agreement, you and I. I am never going to dominate you, but you are not going to try to dominate me. So I grabbed the Bible and I said, look, we have the Word of God. This book has all authority. If I ever make a mistake, you have the authority to correct me through this word, through, the, through this book. If you make a mistake, I will also have the authority to correct you only if it's through the word of God. So we did not impose the law of chauvinism. You know, there's a lot of chauvinism in my country and man tried to dominate women. But in Christ Jesus, there is no difference between man or woman because the Lord, He is the epicenter of our home and that is why I gave a place of honor to my wife where she could feel that she is very important to me. And that is why the Lord said, your home needs to be a model. And so that which I applied with my wife is the same thing that we have applied with our daughters. And because they have seen our relationship as a couple, they never see us fighting or arguing. We never argue. You know, I was in a meeting. It was a pastor's uh, luncheon that was in Mexico City. And so I was sitting at a table next to a pastor who asked me, he said, Pastor, how often do you fight? Do you argue with your wife? And I said, no, we never fight. We never argue. He was like shocked. And he, his face was like he had a frown. And he said, look, I really don't believe that. But I guess I have to believe you because you're my pastor. How could you say you never fight with your wife? I can't stand my wife. And I said, look, if you fight with your wife, it's not going to go well for you. You're not going to do well in life by fighting with your wife. I said, look, I'm a man of wisdom. I prefer for her to win the discussions, but I am winning a great relationship. Look, our relationship is so good that we never have arguments. She's never trying to impose anything on me. 
She's always giving me good suggestions, and I do the same thing. I never impose anything. You have to do this or that. No, I suggest things, and there is harmony, and my daughters see that, and my son Matthias. And so they also live that kind of lifestyle. And the Lord said to me, he said, treat your wife the way you would treat the Holy Spirit. And look, in all honesty, that has helped us so much. There are men that I don't know what it is that they think in their mind about their wife, and they allow conflict in their relationship. Look, if you could get over that, you're going to be so grateful to God because your lives are going to change in a drastic way. And that is why within our family there is respect. Not only do I respect my wife, I respect my children, and I see that my daughters respect each other. Sometimes there are differences, some friction, but they're able to get over things quickly. Fourth priority. The Lord spoke to me about the ministry. Look, the ministry is the number four priority. It is not first. It is not above your family. It is not above our own selves. It is not above anything else. It is our fourth priority. If we are well with God, if we are well with Him, if we are well with our family, the ministry is going to flow. So many pastors have invested their lives in the ministry, but they neglected their families. They ended up losing everything. Why? Because their priorities were in this order. And the fifth priority is her secular duties. Look, your secular duties are last. But to a lot of people, that is number one. No way. That cannot be number one. Because the Lord, He knows our needs, and He fulfills every one of our needs needs according to his riches and glory. Dear pastors, and you need to understand that God wants to bless you. God wants to use you. God wants to really lift you up. He wants to put you at the tip of a spear to influence many people's lives, many cities and many nations. But you need to make the right corrections in your lives. That is why I'm so grateful to God for your lives. And I share this message from my heart to you because I know what the Lord wants to do with every one of you. Now, please allow me to pray a prayer for you. Father, in this moment, I present the life of all the pastors let it be your hand, your anointing and grace upon every one of them. And I pray, O oh Lord, that they could put every area of their lives in order. Lord, I pray that they could have a great relationship with you, that they could understand the areas that are deep inside their life, their intuition, their communion, their conscience. And I pray that you give them victory in a supernatural way in every one of those areas. If there are any bondages of the occult, teach them how to break them. If there are any bondages of immorality, help them to break those bondages if there are any bondages in their conscience things that are bringing accusations help them to be free and Lord I pray that you breathe your breath of life on them if there are any areas that have affected their families that have affected their relationship as a family I pray that you give them strategies so that they could have the courage to repent to ask forgiveness of one another and be restored. I pray that you lift them up so that they could flow in the ministry. And Lord, I pray that they could experience great provision. If they work a part-time job, give them great provision. Lord, I bless every one of the pastors in Philippines and I pray that it will be your grace upon every one of them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Well, dear pastors, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share with you. We love you so much. I pray that God will bless you and be with you in everything.